Hey everyone, welcome to Apollo Security Weekly episode from the vault. We go in the Wayback Machine, deep within the vault, to bring you an interview with Bill Cheswick from episode number 326. Bill logged into his first computer in 1968. Seven years later, he was graduated from Lehigh University in 1975 with a degree resembling computer science. Chez, as he's called, has worked on and against operating system security for over 35 years. He is probably best known for firewalls and internet security, Repelling the Wily Hacker, an amazing book that he co-authored with Steve Bellavin, which helped train the first generation of internet security experts. This is before we had the term cybersecurity. Chez is a brilliant and insightful thinker, and he shares his knowledge and experience with passion and enthusiasm. I highly recommend this episode to anyone who wants to learn more about the internet and the early days of cybersecurity. With that, enjoy the interview with one of the pioneers in our field, Bill Cheswick. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. I'd like to now introduce our feature interview for the show. Bill Cheswick logged into his first computer in 1968. Seven years later, he was graduated from Lehigh University in 1975 with a degree in a degree resembling computer science. Chez has also worked on and against operating system security for over 35 years. He's probably best known for firewalls and internet security, Repelling the Wily Hacker, co-authored with Steve Belovin, uh, which helped train the first generation of internet security experts. Welcome, Bill, to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So, Bill, how did you get your start in information security? A little background about uh, maybe how you got started briefly in 1968 and then a little after. Well, 1968, uh, when I got to school, there was a teletype in the corner, and it uh, it connected to the GE time-sharing system, and there was a login command. But really, I wasn't into system security. I just looked and said, hmm, computers, they're the wave of the future. I should learn a little about them. Mm. And about six weeks later, I was hooked. Nice. Smart move. Well, yeah. Yeah, it turns out really was. Um I was at Lehigh by 1970 and uh, started working on their mainframe there. And uh, actually, our problem was that you couldn't... Back in those days, they used to count how much CPU time you had and charge for it. So if you had something that took more than eight CPU seconds, it would throw, stop your job and say, whoa, too much, you didn't pay for this. Hmm. And um, I wanted to run longer jobs. So... My buddies and I started figuring out ways to hack the system to get more CPU time. It's funny. We still do that today with Amazon, but the host <laughs> well, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> funny how things come around in circles. What advice do you have for people who are getting their start in the field today? Ooh. <laughs> um, they probably do better in genomics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you, I've been looking at security problems now since the mid 80s. And this stuff, it gets boring after a while. You know, advanced persistent threats? No, they're just persistent. You know, they're getting a little better on the attacks. But this stuff, it, it gets a little boring after a while. It's all the same stuff. Weak machines, easy to break into. People get screwed. Um, I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so uh, have there been significant changes in information security? Oh, sure. We have a lot more tools, things to go scanning, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, you know, the attacks are getting more sophisticated. Look at Stuxnet. Uh, but our defenses are still pretty similar to what they were 25 years ago. Mm. And, and why is it that you think people have not evolved to adopt better defensive mechanisms? Well, the problem is that our computers are not secure in the first place. We're building our houses on sand. And the first of all, 
it's hard to write secure programs. And secondly, almost nobody wants to use them. You know, for example, I'm using Skype right now. Uh, how do I design a system that's secure all the way up to Skype, for example, but if Skype was is insecure, it can still put it in a sandbox. This sort of technology, which we've been working on since the 60s, you know, they're called operating systems, still doesn't really seem to to gel around something that can be defensive. I, I think one of the big problems is that we keep moving the bar. You know, when you build a bridge, you build a bridge, it falls down, you say, what do we do wrong? Oh, that, okay, we'll build it this way. And eventually you come up with a bridge design that doesn't fall down. We're not doing that in computers. We keep trying new designs and new stuff that's mostly driven by what people want to run and not, not some goal that an engineer can slowly cycle around through and converge on something that's secure. Mm. That's interesting. It's, you describe it as a much more fundamental problem um, than I've heard described in the past, which is kind of frightening in a way. I'm kind of well, scared right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's at that level. Um, and, and we can do it. For example, back in the late 80s, the program I loved to rag on was SendMail, mm -hmm. uh, written by my friend Eric Allman. And for the next 10 years, SendMail was full of holes. It ran as root. It was gigantic. It had accidental backdoors in it. It had intentional backdoors in it. <laughs> but, you know, that program has actually been improved and sort of annealed almost in a metallurgical sense. And I haven't heard of a bug in SendMail in a decade. Mm. I, I think eventually if you keep working on the software, even something that started from something that really was not very secure at all, mm -hmm. um, you can actually tighten it up eventually if you don't try to change it too much. So what's Adobe's problem? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, basically, their stuff is too complicated. In yeah, order to yeah. do what they want to do, uh, they have very complicated, full-featured things. Um, and not to blame Adobe for this, we products where you can put software like that safely. Mm -hmm. So the the almost the environment it's running in is not lending itself to be secured, which is the browser. well. That's right. And and if you do make it secure enough, then some features will be missing, and people get upset. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that is the operating system, which, like you said, we're just constantly changing and never working towards that goal where it's a stable bridge. That's right. And in fact, um, and, and the operating itself, system itself is complicated. There, last time I looked, and this was a long time ago, there's something like 1,300 system calls to Windows. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need that many. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Plan 9 had, oh, I don't know, something like 15. Mm -hmm. um less is more You're right um so at at some point you decided to write a book and uh it's a very pro yeah. prolific book that uh most people are familiar with in our in our field firewalls and internet security repelling the wily hacker what prompted you to write the book um well it was 1993 and there was a lot of stuff going on with firewalls and uh i looked around and thought you know we could glue 13 papers together, and it would sort of cover what firewalls are. There'd been a few papers written and so on. So I went to Steve Bellavin, uh, and he said, ooh, I have a publisher that's been bugging me for 10 years to write a book. So we talked to the publisher, and he said, this is a great idea, but no, you can't staple 18 or fit 13 papers together. You have to write it yourself. It's sort of like your English teacher saying, you have 13 themes do. <laughs> and it really felt like that. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of writing, but uh, I found that working with a co-author was wonderful because I could write a chapter. I like to sort of blurt out 30 paragraphs, but I don't want to read them again. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I could send them to Steve, and the next morning they'd come back and they'd be 50 paragraphs, and they'd be different and edited, and I'd go through and edit them. And we could bounce back and forth and sometimes get a, a chapter done in a couple of days. Right, right. So that made it a lot easier. It helps to have a smart co-author. And of course, with English papers, you're not allowed to have co-authors. Mm. Um, the other thing is you sit down and say, well, we need topics on this, 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 and this. Well, I need something on this, but I don't know enough about it. So you take time off and spend two or three, four days sort of diving into what it is and how it works and, and uh, getting it in understanding it well enough to write about it. And, you know, the timing was just perfect. Um, 
we had a draft pretty much ready to go in mid-March of 1994. There were people out there. It was going to come out in May. There were people who said, I have to build a firewall next week. Can I have a copy of your book? <laughs> and what we said was, yes, but you have to read it in three days and we want your corrections back. <laughs> <laughs> and we did this with about six different people over a period of about four weeks. Nice. And they really helped us shake the bugs out. So when it finally came out, bam, we were there. That's awesome. awesome. That's awesome. That's a great tip for people who are publishing, by the way. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the publishers, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are hackers still wily? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was also uh, probably one of my fondest titles because um, I think of the Wiley Coyote and I, I kind of associate hackers in the same in the same light because of that title. Well, that that title was taken from Cliff Stahl's book. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny. You can talk about an advanced uh, persistent threat. And that's probably one of my first um, w uh, ways in which I found in my research that advanced persistent threat existed uh, was when I read uh, the Cuckoo's Egg. Yeah. Um, so uh, what things have remained the same that are allowing the number of breaches to persist specifically? Uh, well, gosh, uh, I'm not sure quite how to answer that. Um, what things have remained the same? Well, for one thing, it's hard to write bug free software. Mm. And if it's hard to write bug-free software, it's hard to write. Some bugs are security bugs. And I have colleagues who think we will never win this. Mm. That game's over, man. We just will never make a completely bug-free piece of software. I don't think that's true. I think it can be done. It would take a lot of money and a lot of testing. And the specifications have to be right. And you keep doing it over and over again. I think we could do that. And there are people who are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill, but it's isn't a, that it's, isn't go that ahead. kind of what the United States government tried to do with like the Orange Book series years ago, and kind uh, of gave up on that idea. No, uh, the Orange Book was setting up, and it was written as a bunch of suggestions originally. The authors once told me they were surprised it became a standard. Um, the Orange Book was a list of rules that suggested how to make things better for their particular environment, which is uh, levels of secrecy. Um, they didn't want top secret stuff leaking out into the world. And of course that, but, but stuff could leak in if you wanted. So the, the orange book would let you send a virus to it from the outside into a top secret compartment in Ooh. principle. Ah. Uh, not such a good deal. Now they, they did talk about B level and a level and provably secure systems. And they actually built some and uh, you know, they had limited use. I blame uh, Bella yeah. Padula. Say, I'm sorry, say again? Sorry, I said I blame Bella Padula. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know, there was a lot of stuff written back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s um, that is still right on the money in security. Those guys knew what they were doing. A lot of them were spooks. Some of them did not publish public in the public literature. Uh, they were way ahead of us in many ways uh, because they had enemies who were thinking along these lines and willing to spend a lot of money on this stuff. So a lot of those early papers have perfectly reasonable security uh, axioms and maxims. Uh, some, not so much. I was just writing about the, um, the password paper that the DOD gave, gave out, STD-002, in 1985. Boy, they called it STD? No, a standard. It was a standard paper. And oh, that's, okay. That's only a small piece of the full name of it of the paper. Um, but I wrote about this in ACMQ recently. Uh, you wonder where the password length of eight characters comes from. Yeah. Where does that yeah. come from? Well, this paper said that uh, if someone is guessing passwords at full speed, they should have one chance in a million of guessing the password in a year. That's 120 characters a second into a time-sharing system. They figured they could try about 14 passwords a minute. And yeah, if you do that, uh, and you want to make sure that the password isn't cracked one chance in a million in a year, you have to make it eight characters long. And 
So they had they had math in there, and it was perfectly reasonable math for those assumptions. If you plug in our current assumptions with a GPU cracking passwords, maybe trying what three billion a second, uh, you get a recommended password change time of fifty five microseconds. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and and yet. There's still rules. You go to the pass these sites and they'd say how long the password should be. They're still talking eight characters. So uh, according to the, the new math, um, do we need to double the length of our passwords or does that even matter? No, if, if you did the math um, and you're willing to use all 95 keys on the keyboard, I think I found that you could do it in about 13. Gotcha. But you're not picking the 13. I mean, they're completely random characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the answer to all of that password stuff is to reduce the number of tries to about four. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, speaking of uh, defensive technologies, um, you've done some work in the past in honeypots. Um, I, I, can honeypots help defend your networks? Is this sure. more, is this, but is it more of an academic experiment, as some people no. will argue, or is it a valid defensive measure and why? No, no. It, uh, what it is is an alarm system. Um, very early on, I, you know, I had just built this firewall and written a paper about it in 1990. This was a steel firewall. No one was coming through this baby. And I said, okay, how many people are attacking this firewall? So I put a whole bunch of little alarms, sort of really early honeypot sorts of stuff and would look at the attacks coming in and try to figure out if they were evil or not and tell people they'd been hacked and so on. And that was pretty academic. Um, but nowadays, uh, and, and, you know, I got tired of that. It was like counting bugs on a windshield. You know, yeah, fine, there are bugs out there. But nowadays, you know, you have a firewall and a perimeter defense. The inside is supposed to be clean. There are not supposed to be any bad guys on the inside. Of course, there are. So if you set up a honeypot on the inside, you can detect people who have gotten past your first level of security and maybe your second level of security. So I think it's a good idea to set up machines named payroll that nobody knows about. But if someone comes and pokes it, you can go chase them down. Um, or a network that's bogus. Uh, there's also this idea uh, that Fred Cohen came up with called the Deception Toolkit, uh, which is a system that as you hack deeper and deeper into it, you can't tell if you're making progress or if he's just leading you down some hacker trail into deeper into a honeypot. And uh, you can learn techniques that way. Uh, it is a tool that, that can be useful. Mm. John, did you have any, uh, I know you've also done a lot of research in this area. No, I just, I, I just you know, kind of want to echo the same thing. I mean, I, I agree 110%. Unfortunately, many organizations look at honeypot technologies as purely academic and research. But there's so much value in what you can do, especially on the inside of an environment. Because if you look at our security technologies today, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, AV, the bad guys can back, bypass those things really, really well. But as Bill's talking about, if you have something that's like accounts payable or, you know, research and development servers and a bad guy interacts with that server, that means that something bad has happened. And once right. again, looking at a lot of the attacks today, they're bypassing a lot of our traditional security technologies. It's a way of creating something that'll catch with those things missed. That's right. It's, it's like putting a security camera inside the vault. Mm. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, I, I think we, some work needs to be done to convince people that um, they need to be doing that inside of their networks. Um, so I, I was reading your, um, about you in your, uh, bio and it said that you once pinged a nuclear attack submarine. Was that accessible from the internet or are you sworn to secrecy? No, I was not sworn to secrecy. It was accessible from the internet. Um, from about 1998 to 2011, I ran the internet mapping project along with Hal Birch and the people at Lumetta. And in the in the last ten years, that was basically sending a third of a million trace routes out every morning to uh, a third of a million networks, and recording that data. And I have that data recorded. And uh, one fellow went back and looked through this, and on one day, the packet went into the Navy network and hit a machine called the SSN Hawaii. <laughs> um, now, okay, 
So I had to go investigate this. It was in the Navy address space. What about this nuclear submarine Hawaii? Well, it turns out the packet came back two months before the newspapers had announced that they'd put the conning tower on the submarine. So it was still in parts where they build submarines. <laughs> oh, um, I so I don't know if this was some test mail server or something like that. Um, no, it wasn't under the ocean sailing away, receiving Internet packets. I'm told they don't do that. Uh, <laughs> well, they don't have the bandwidth, if nothing else, through the, the, the antennas they have. Um, right, and getting that to those those radio frequencies to work underwater. That's right. You you, you get a few bits a second at, at most, and they're they're not opening a mail server or whatever it was that I got. But it was there, and it was in the you know. It, it, I think I found the Class C network that was assigned to that submarine, and so yeah, I I I'd say we did ping it. That's awesome. <laughs> That's fun. Wow. So we've talked on the show, Bill, about uh, infosec burnout is uh, something that uh, Jack Daniel has uh, brought up on the show and done some research on, and how information security professionals, more often than other uh, fields, will suffer from burnout. And this is, again, unscientific research. But um, why do you think this seems, uh, problem seems to be worse in our field, that people tend to get burnt out? Well, assuming it's true, and certainly I have a lot of friends who are really sick and tired of this, I think it's because we're not making much progress. Mm. Um, you know, it's pretty much the same stuff. Okay, Stuxnet was new in a bunch of ways. It's really how the pros do it. Um, but even then, you can sort of line up how they did it. It was an impressive job. But it 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 was so a, a very effective attack. And the defenses are, holy smokes, they only have to find one hole in my defense. And they're in. So I've got to do layer after layer. And and you have to be on your toes, and and then thumb drives come along. Um, you know, you can you, you can take a thumb drive apart, and the little thing is smaller than a sugar cube. You could swallow it. How is anyone going to do security with that? Uh, certainly, physical security. So I, I, you bring up a very interesting point that uh, I kind of touched upon, and uh, that I might some of my notes for later in the show, but. Um, a lot of people will look at their networks and systems and say, well, I'm going to try and figure out where my sensitive data lives. And I'm going to focus my security efforts around systems and processes where my sensitive data lives. And, yeah. and there's going to be other things that maybe fall off, but they're not systems critical to where my sensitive data lives. However, yeah. if you look at attackers, the way that they approach the network is they will find the lowest barrier to entry, enter the yeah. network, and then escalate from there. So it's almost right. like, I, do you think we need to change our whole outlook on how we look at vulnerabilities in our networks and start with fixing the easy stuff first, regardless of what information is protecting, and work our way from there? Well, I, I would rather that the target was so hardened that it doesn't matter that there's, there's corrupt machines around it. For example, mm. printers. Printers as for as long as I can remember, have had really lousy TCP IP stacks. They tend to be insecure. So there must be day zeros for printers, which means if I connect to your network, I can probably get a printer or some other device to be a pal and start doing what I want there. That shouldn't have any effect on anything. Um, I shouldn't be able to attack anything useful. Of course, I can do mapping. That is that is important. Um, but it really gets down to the vital thing that you're trying to protect, only being able to access it from certain machines by certain people and having those machines secure. When a bad guy breaks into a, a, a big site, they go and look for these system administrators. They want to take over their machines. They want to read their emails, see if anyone suspects. They want to find out what machines are important to the system administrator and then go through the administrator into the final machine, which, you, of course, you hope is secure in the first place. Though maybe it isn't. Mm. <clears throat> um, it didn't I really answer your question, did well, it? Did no, I, well, you brought up another interesting point, which I, I think is great, is that uh, attackers will target administrator machines as an indicator to see if they're detecting um, their presence on the network. Also finding out what's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're right, in a large network, figuring out what's important by scanning can take a long time. Where sniffing a few emails, you might get right to it. That that helps. 
Um, there is a mapping portion that most will do. Um, but uh, to give you, um, uh, when I worked at Lumetta, we learned uh, that a corporation, a high-tech corporation, has about two active IP addresses per employee. Mm. And that was a pretty good rule of thumb, too. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to run around and try to do all the low-hanging fruit, you're never going to end. Right, there's right. just too many devices out there. I think the perimeter makes you feel like there's an inside that's in somehow safer. Mm -hmm. And it really shouldn't be. You really need bulkheads, and you've got to go into the locked room to get to the payroll machine. And that's a hard way to run a business. It may be you can't run the business at all that way. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So at some point in your career, you worked at Bell Labs. Now, you probably had some uh, interesting co-workers at Bell Labs, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, I say, actually, I'd say all the co-workers were interesting at Bell Labs. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, uh, very uh, famous and infamous people, right, that worked at, at Bell Labs during that time. It was an astonishing place to work and quite an honor to be there. I was there for a little over 12 years. Um, I arrived basically as an IT guy into the computer science research group. Um, I decided... Why not be system administrator for Dennis Ritchie? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's basically, it wasn't the job title back then, but I came in and looked around and I said, hmm, this network, this is a wave of the future. I should learn a little more about it. <laughs> You're getting a theme here? <laughs> uh, and I went to Dave Prezado, who had recently built a firewall for Bell Labs. And, I, and he was postmaster. And I said, I want both those jobs. Let me run the firewall. Let me take the postmaster job, which is a really crappy job, as you know. Oh, it's the I've, sort of thing that I've when served, it works, yeah. nobody notices you. Yeah. And when it fails, you have important people yelling at you. Well, you, you talked about send mail before. Yes, I'm deeply scarred from being postmaster for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turns out Dave Prezado, about three years before, had decided that send mail was a disaster and wrote his own mailer, which is the sort of thing that happens at Bell Labs, mm. or at least it did. Um, so he had his own mailer, which I loved using. It's called UPAS, mm -hmm. U-P-A-S. Um, so, yeah, I was actually working in the computer science research group. Dennis Ritchie, Brian Kernahan, Ken Thompson, Dave Prezado, uh, uh, Bjarne Saustrup, uh, Brian Kernahan, did I say him already? Rob Pike, Tom Duff. Uh, and and a whole bunch of other people you've never heard of who were also remarkable. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you really get to learn your stuff there. Um, it, you know, you, it, it, it was basically a, a, a postgraduate class for me for right, years. Right, right, right. And after a couple of years, I designed this new firewall and put it up. And I looked around and said, all these PhDs are writing papers. I could write a paper. So I wrote a paper. And gave it to my boss, and he read it and said, this is a good paper. Cool. So I submitted it to Usenix, and it got accepted, and that was my first paper. Mm, that's awesome. No, I, I, I so think uh, I, I, I worked there for until 2000. I worked on internet mapping, a bunch of different firewall stuff. I worked on Plan 9 some. Um, and there were, of course, lots and lots of other things going on. It was just amazing being there back then. Mm. Um, no, I, I think uh, place. hearing your story is certainly inspiring for a lot of people who listen to the show who are getting their start in information security. So, Well, I hope so, except that uh, there are still good people doing good work at Bell Labs, but it's not what it was 20 oh, years yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, excellent. So let's see. Let's uh, dive back into, um, so along the lines of honeypots, um, something that John Strand and I are, are researching a lot late, lately is uh, the concept of hacking back. Uh, and, yes. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure you know being around uh, security for as long as you have, um, that topic has come up more than once. I'm, I'd imagine, and some say we should never hack back. Um, others are trying to come up with innovative ways to trap attackers and fight back. What, what are your thoughts on the, the okay, hacking back? Um, uh, I watched the, the maybe the very first time that happened on computing and we wrote about it in the firewalls book it was the rome labs attack rome labs is an air force laboratory and there were a couple of people there who were being attacked and they wanted to chase back these attackers to a hack back 
through the chain of machines. Of course, these attacks were laundered through a bunch of machines, and you'd have to unravel this. Mm. And in the first and probably only time this has ever happened, they actually got reassigned to, let me see if I can get this right, to the U.S. Department of Justice from the Air Force for a short period of time so that it would be legal for them to attack hot hot offensive attacks back through to try to unravel the the attack chain and catch the people who had been attacking. Um, but, uh, and that was the first attack I know of of that sort. And of course, this is still a popular subject. Um, it, it's, it, it's not going to work very well because the other guys can hide or they're in some place where you can't reach them. Um, I mean, you want to do something to them, but usually you can't. Hmm. Interesting. So that, that first story of hacking back didn't pan out quite the way they had hoped. No, I, you know, at this point it's been over 20 years. I don't remember if they actually found the source of the attacks, mm -hmm. but they did get reassigned back to the air force and, uh, and they wrote about it, and that's the Rome Labs attack. That's the earliest case I know of of this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. John, did you have any other questions along those lines? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've been working on quite a bit, Bill, instead of actively attacking the IP addresses of the attacker, is basically creating files and creating things the attacker would be interested in taking back with them. So for, take, for example, one of our customers, we created an Excel spreadsheet that had some quote unquote sensitive data in it. Yeah, the hacker quickly grabbed this spreadsheet, opened it up, and we were able to get full location as far as where the bad guy was because they, they actually opened that document back up. Do you yeah. think that that may be a more feasible approach? Because we, sure. we don't advocate at all attacking the bad guy's IP address because you just don't know if that's really their IP address or not. Yeah, uh, uh, one of the ways that some people have done this over the years is single uh, pixel images in a web page. And you see where that gets loaded from, which is also similar to it. Marcus Ranum had an idea many years ago. Uh, he said, we should put in a file with a really funny new joke. And if we hear that joke breaking out in the Kremlin or something, we'll know they got our file. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Like um, uh, and of course, uh, Cliff Stahl again did did pretty much the same thing. He put up bait SDI net, though you couldn't tell. Actually, I guess they did track that down some. Uh, to, to some, but there was stuff in the SDI net docs that caused some further probes to occur. So again, it's along the same lines. Yeah, if you can do that, that's great. Um, but I don't know what good it's going to do you. I mean, okay, so it was opened and it was opened in Latvia. Now what? Well, I, I, but even with that, I think that there's some value in it. For example, for a lot of organizations, they don't really know who's after their data. And because of that, they don't make good decisions as far as like how much they should budget. If you all of a sudden realize that you're under attack by like the Chinese government, I think that would change upper management's approach and the funding and the way that they handle information security in their organization. That's probably true. And it's hard to tell, though, from recent reports, I guess the Chinese government hasn't been hiding its work very much. Um, no, they yeah, they've been they pretty brazen about much. it lately. Yeah. yeah, they don't care. So, which maybe works against them then. Uh, uh, that So, you know, maybe that's a mistake for them because people get more serious about it. You know, Eric Gross is um, uh, used to be my boss at Bell Labs and is now, I think, head of security at Google. And he told the story at RSA that, you know, they were setting up security for Google and they said, OK, we're going to make this secure. We're not going to try to be secure against national governments. We're just going to do regular security. And, of course, you know the history of Google security, that Chinese actually were attacking Google. And he said, oh, OK, I guess we do need the level of security to keep national hmm. governments out. Um, hmm. And uh, the the nice thing about that, that that costs a lot of money, and security is part of the overhead, so it's a, a tough sell and probably should be. But once you're dealing with that level, a lot of other problems go away. I mean, if you have mil military grade security, you can actually things are a little better, I think. Yeah. So, Billy, it begs the question, and this is something that's debated: How well should you know your attacker? I mean, what should you know about your attacker? Should you know? You know, you said before, knowing their location, maybe knowing who they are is too much. But what what should you know about your attacker to help form your defenses? Uh, 
I, I guess what you really need to know, and I don't know if you can tell this, is how much time, money, and risk are they willing to spend to get your stuff? Mm, that's a very good answer to that question. And, and you yeah. know, that is always the balance in security. Mm -hmm. What are you defending? How much is it worth? And how much effort is the attacker willing to go through to get it? And, yep. of course, cyber attacks tend to be quite cheap. Yes. Um, I mean, more and more so, it seems like the cost of attacks just keeps going down. Right. So that's really what you need to know. Um, one of the things we did early on in the Burford incident, and I've done in subsequent years, including uh, an iPhone theft that I had a few years ago, is look at when they're using the devices or making the attack and try to figure out when they sleep. Mm. And usually... You can tell this sort of stuff. With the Japanese attacks that are recent, apparently they started at 8 a.m. Beijing time and end at 5 p.m. Beijing time is what I read one place. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. It's kind of interesting. Now, obviously, you could fool it. You know, sorry, dear, I can't sleep tonight. I'm pretending to be in the Ukraine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I say that all the time to my wife. <laughs> yeah, that's actually the life of most pen testers. Yeah. Every one of our pen tests has to be after hours, so I might as well just move to Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've heard two theories on pen testing hours. Uh, they're, they're, some companies say, oh, man, you know, we're running production during the daytime. You can only do it from Saturday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. because that's when all the markets are closed. And there are others who say, no, you've got to do it on weekdays, 9 to 5, because that's when I've got all my people ready for you. Yeah, I mean, I, my advice to companies would be to do both, right? And the goal being is to be able to detect and uh, prevent it in, in both time slots, right? But so big deal, you can, you can prevent it from 9 to 5, but if after that time... I'm launching the same attacks and no one's responding to them, then you've got a problem. Well, the, well, the, the great, I think the important takeaway that, here is that you need to... That's true, oh, but the issue here is that pen testers sometimes break machines. And yep, that's always a possibility, absolutely. You know, and when the mm -hmm. CEO says the customers are angry because these pen testers, uh, you know, took down our systems, that's a hard sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the, the flip side of that, it's better that uh, a pen tester breaks it because now we can reproduce what we did and help you fix it rather than an attacker breaks it. It's much harder. Oh, oh I'm, I'm not arguing that it shouldn't be done. It should be. Um, but sometimes it's, it's a hard sell. Let mm. me tell you one story I heard from a, a fellow at DISA, a friend of mine in the military. Um, a few years ago, uh, one of these viruses was coming out, a worm was coming out, and it was attacking the web servers. And I think maybe it was Melissa attacking the IIS servers. It was something like that. And this attack was going all over the network. And these people were running, among other things, NipperNet, the non-secret government network of machines, a military mm -hmm. network. And they said, OK, we got to keep this worm from coming port 80 calls. And they learned a little while later that all of a sudden, the Army Corps of Engineers was unable to open and close the locks on the Mississippi River. Oh, no. Now, this is not something that anyone probably would have thought of. This is one of those dependencies because the Internet is so important to the network, to the world commerce and so on. We have so many things in there that require uh, the Internet and, and interdependence and all that stuff. Um, what does this lesson teach us? Um, it looks to me like... We should, every once in a while, cut the wires and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, again, the CEO isn't going to like that. And what do you do if you're cutting off Marines in combat? Mm. Um, that's, that is a, it, it's hard. On the other hand, it makes it more robust if you, if you do that. And, of course, there is another way to do this. And I, I guess it's the best you can do. Set up a bunch of people who are watching all the time. And wait for the outages that happen anyway. Right, right. Uh, but that requires real knowledge and alertness. And, and, you know, when something's down, holy smokes, it's down for three minutes. While those people are fixing it, we're going to go see what isn't working that normally is supposed to work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a really good take on uh, network operations. Um, 
in system uptime. On a, on a lighter note, Bill, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you like to hack around with at home? Well, my house, for one thing. Yeah, exp- exp- explain to us what, what kind of house hacking that you do. I mean, you taking okay. sledgehammers to walls and, and, and rearranging it? Because that's what some people call That's what I call house hacking sometimes. No, this is much, much more recognizable hacking. Think X10. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Home automation, because I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, I've got a computer that, whose auxiliary out, the sound port is connected to the auxiliary input of the intercom. So the computer can talk to the house. Yeah, it, it's I've got a voice synthesizer. I play stuff. So, for example, it gives a chime at the top of the hour. And, of course, because I'm running NTP, it's really at the top of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't chime in the middle of the night because that's not when the cron job runs. <laughs> so that's a simple one. It uh, tells what... When the sun sets, it turns on the lights out front and turns them off a little bit later. It tells when the space station is passing overhead, which is kind of cool. You go outside, you watch it go over. It's a nice little thing to do in the evening. That's cool. And, you know, so it does it verbally does it flares? Does it actually um, say that? Like, attention, please. Their satellite is now passing overhead. Actually. I found a little bleepy sound on the internet, and it plays. It goes bleep, 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 bleep. Okay, oh, so that's your satellite passing bleep, over sound. Yeah. And, and then Stephen Hawking says that the space station is passing overhead <laughs> altitude. Out of the moon. Bill, you, Bill, so you, uh, Bill, you almost made me spill my spit my beer all over my computer <laughs> with that <so> one. Awesome. <laughs> well, so and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. Is it trash day? Is it recycling day? It tells you the night before when it's recycling day. Um, Reminds us of birthdays. It wakes up every morning and tells us the weather and the top news stories and where the planets are. Um, it's I've got a voice modem hooked up so that the caller ID is announced in the house for who's calling. <laughs> That's great. You know, and each one of these is a little project that was done one Saturday, and it all sort of stays together and works. Um, one of the ones I really like, there is a special email address that will go announce text to that to that so if my daughter wants to have an eye chat she's over in edinburgh she sends a message and our house suddenly says ding 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 is anyone up for a chat and we go over to eye chat and turn on the machine and turn it up and have a video chat with my daughter Excellent. that's awesome so that's there's awesome. a whole bunch of stuff and i think i have on my web page most of the features i put in over the years now is that uh, something other people can run or is that just something you've well, you know, yourself. it's a whole bunch of little parts, you know, cron jobs and mm. little shell scripts and things like that. Um, it isn't just a, a, a nice, easy service. Right, right. I I think what ought to happen is somebody like Microsoft ought to come up with a book. And you, when you're building a house, you give this to the contractor and he follows the rules in the book. And when the house is done, you slide a PC in, plug in the wires, and now you have a Microsoft standard house. Mm. That's not I wouldn't a bad, want that's a Microsoft. A I, want well, a Lin- I want a Linux. <laughs> I want shell um, scripts and cron jobs. <laughs> of, of course. And in fact, if the house met those standards, of course, there'd be an Ubuntu version that would plug in and do it as well. Right, right, right. So, so, so Bill, you know, I, I, I've done the, the home automation stuff for years in our old house and haven't gotten a chance to do a lot of it in our new one that we built two years ago. but. You, you you start hearing these types of things from you doing your house hacking. Uh, and, and I see this sort of the direct evolution or into something like the, the whole wearable computing uh, movement that came out of MIT in the, in the nineties. And sure. uh, so what do you think about this whole Google glass thing? I'm looking forward to them. I'm an early adopter. Um, I hope they work with my glasses because I have <laughs> extremely cool glasses. Um <laughs> Uh, I, I want to see how it works. I'm I'm an early adopter. I'll give them a try. Yeah, I'm I'm one of those kind of guys that if the, they handed me one uh, right now, I'd put it on and start using it. Was that a oh, play? Absolutely. Was that a play on? Was that a play on words? I want to see how it works. It uh, no, no. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, now, Bill, are you uh, speaking at any conferences or uh, attending any conferences where where people can uh, check you out? Well, um, I I do go to conferences. Um, Gosh, uh, I know you mentioned RSA. Were you at the the RSA conference this year, or yes, I was at RSA in San Francisco for the first half of the week. 
Um, I, I go to some private conferences. I guess Usenix Security, I always go to. That's mm -hmm. in August. It's in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's the best concentration of security people in any conference I know of. Mm -hmm. So I always go to that one. Um, and, and I do some others. I'm between jobs right now. So uh, I get to go to the conferences I want to go to, and I have to think about what, I, you know, what I'm working on these days. Mm -hmm. So it sort of varies, but uh, some security conferences. I've been to the Tech Users Group meeting uh, recently because I've been working on something there. Um, and, uh, yeah, stuff like that, I guess. Awesome. Awesome. Um, let's see. So someone posted a, your, um, your website is cheswick.com, right? Right. And, uh, the book website, was it wileyhacker.com? Dot org, I believe. Wileyhacker.org, uh, for those that want to, uh, check up on Bill's work and, uh, read more about it. So Bill, thank you very much for appearing on paul.com. It was wonderful wait, talking wait. to you. Oh, do we have five questions for you? Are you ready for five questions? Sure. Excellent. You okay. have four more. <laughs> okay, so six questions. Uh, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> um, security people are paid to think bad thoughts. And I have thought a lot of bad thoughts. <laughs> and I am not going to answer that question publicly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the most frightening answer we've ever had to that question. Um, three words to describe yourself. Jolly science guy. If you had to write a book about yourself, what would it be? What would the title be? Sorry. I've actually worked on this a little bit. The uh, title, right, working title, and I probably will never write the book, is How to Pass Gas in Front of 320 Enthusiastic Germans. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> wait, wait, now uh, I gotta hear the story, but no. Uh, well, I'll, wait for, I'll wait for the book. Stranded on a desert island. <laughs> don't wait for the book. I'm not gonna write it. <laughs> stranded on a desert island, which tablet would you take with you if you could only choose one? An iPad, an Android, or a Surface? Oh, I, I'm a I, I'm a fanboy for Apple. Excellent. 